Israel at war, and innocent civilians, men, women, children, and even babies, savagely killed by Hamas terrorists, and hostages taken, among them Americans. In our next Focus on America's Hope, we examine what's unfolding in Israel. We'll talk to Rabbi David Wolpe, Dr. Raleigh Washington, and Dr. Ben Carson. That's our next subject of America's Hope. Israel at war. The whole world is watching with much anticipation and concern as Israeli defense forces continue to pummel the Gaza Strip. That after hundreds of innocent Israeli civilians were savagely killed during a surprise attack that Hamas terrorists launched from the Gaza Strip along the Israeli border. And now the UN and world leaders are concerned about an impending humanitarian crisis as nearly a million Palestinians try to evacuate the northern areas of Gaza. And President Biden is trying to prevent the escalating warfare from spilling over into a regional conflict. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Wright, and this is America's Hope. The world is on edge as Israel prepares to send soldiers into Gaza to search and destroy the Hamas terror network. Around the world, protesters in support of Hamas and Palestinians are blaming Israel for the ongoing violence, accusing Israel of trying to commit genocide. While on the other side of the equation, pro-Israel protesters are stating that Israel has a right to defend itself against the barbarism of Hamas terrorism. This, they say, is their 9-11, and they vow to destroy Hamas and the President of the United States vows to stand with Israel, sending two battleships to the region. How did we get here? That is the question. The immediate answer is October 7th, 50 years after the Yom Kippur War. Hamas, the radical Islamic terrorist group, launched a brutal surprise attack on Israeli towns just nine days ago, striking villages along the northern border of Gaza Strip. The Hamas terrorists targeted innocent children, women, men, killing many in their homes or at a music festival that was designed to celebrate peace. And while taking others as hostage, including Americans, it has become Israel's 9-11. And in response, Israel stands united in unleashing a lethal counterattack, relentlessly bombarding cities in Gaza. Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu saying, Israel will destroy Hamas. And in an effort to avoid more casualties along, among civilians, I should say, as Israel Defense Forces prepare for an impending ground evasion, they airdropped thousands of leaflets telling one million people in northern Gaza to get out. Meanwhile, President Biden is pledging unwavering support for Israel. So in this moment, we must be crystal clear we stand with Israel. We stand with Israel. The bloody hands of the terrorist organization Hamas, a group whose stated purpose for being is to kill Jews. This is an act of sheer evil. More than 1,000 civilians slaughtered, not just killed, slaughtered in Israel. Among them, at least 14 American citizens killed. And let there be no doubt, the United States has Israel's back. We will make sure the Jewish and democratic state of Israel can defend itself today, tomorrow, as we always have. It's as simple as that. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in the region, meeting with leaders in Israel and throughout the Middle East to use diplomacy to help Palestinians living in Gaza get out of harm's way from an Israeli ground incursion and to help the Palestinian people get the humanitarian support like food, water, medicine, and safe travel away from the war zone. What I've heard from virtually every partner was a determination, a shared view that we have to do everything possible to make sure this doesn't spread to other places. Uh, a shared view uh, to safeguard innocent lives. 
a shared view to get assistance to Palestinians in Gaza uh, who need it, uh, and um, we're working very much uh, on that. And in the wake of that deadly attack on Israeli kibbutzes along the Gaza border, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Karikas of the Israeli Defense Forces explained just how the civilians killed were actually among Jewish people who cared deeply about one day living in harmony with their Palestinian neighbors. It was home to lovely people, people who believed in peace, coexistence, people whom I know because I have friends who are in that kibbutz, had, they had friends in Gaza and they believed that one day we could have peace with Gaza and um, even employed Gazan workers in the kibbutz uh, during these last years. And sadly, peace is quite elusive in the Middle East. And tonight we'll talk about Israel at war with our guests, Dr. Ben Carson, Dr. David Wolpe, rabbi, and Dr. Raleigh Washington, three men who are intimately familiar with the complexities amid the bitter relationships in Israel, between Israelis and those of Hamas. Let's get started. Our first guest tonight is Rabbi David Wolpe. David is the Rabbi Emeritus of Sinai Temple. Now that is one of the largest synagogues here in America. He's also an author, teacher, and a Torah columnist for the Jerusalem Post. He does a number of things. And, and David, welcome to the program. You know, it's so Thanks. heartbreaking and agonizing as we watch what's unfolding with this war between Israel and Hamas. What have you heard from people who you know in Israel? Nothing good. Um, <clears throat> the situation in Israel is extremely difficult. Uh, everybody not only knows people who were killed, I mean, we're talking about a nation of nine million people. So everyone not only knows somebody who was killed in the attack, but a lot of people I've spoken to know people who were taken and they don't know what their fate is, but to be kidnapped by Hamas can't be anything good. And it's, uh, it's both terrifying and tragic. It, indeed it is. And it's, it's like their nine, it's like our nine 11 to them, except one would, one could arguably argue that it's worse than nine 11 and it's almost, uh, equivalent to what people experienced during the Holocaust. Well, it's worse in the sense that at 9-11, remember, we didn't know if there were going to be more attacks. But as it turned out, there was one huge attack, and that was the end of the attacks here related to 9-11. But there, the attack went on much longer, killed more people, um, and proportionately many, many more people than were killed in 9-11 because America is a country of, what, 350 million. And, and Israel is, as I said, about 9 million. Um, and also, it's part of a sustained war that has gone on for a long time between Hamas and uh, Israel. Um, and we should, just for your guests, not between the Palestinians and Israel, because the Palestinians are broken up now into two different groups, one on the West Bank run by the PA, with whom Israel has not really had the kind of clashes that it has with Hamas, and Hamas that has launched rockets periodically into Israel now for many, many years, um, and finally culminated in this brutal assault. You know, David, I, I want to bring this up because you've been a rabbi for most of your adult life. You are an educator, a scholar, and you are currently serving as a visiting scholar at Harvard Divinity uh, there at the Harvard University. You were right. there on campus when a group of students on campus conducted a demonstration in support of Hamas. Uh, right. First, what was your initial reaction to seeing this unfold on your campus? It was so painful to see. And some of the images that were posted on social media were explicitly in support of the murder of Israelis and of Jews. And that was doubly painful to see. And many students there were saying that they really, they felt not unsafe, like someone was going to say something, but they actually felt physically unsafe. 
because they had no idea what the intentions were of people who posted something like that. And I began to think, do you not realize that the kinds of values you espouse, apart from this, if you were under the aegis of Hamas, they wouldn't let you live. Like, there is no diversity under Hamas. And yet these students who almost all march under the banner of progressive diversity and who celebrate LGBTQ values, they don't realize that if you do that in Gaza or the West Bank, that the only way that you're going to be able to, to live your life is if you flee to Israel. And so there's this weird disconnect between what people think they represent and what they in fact represent. And it's just been very hard, um, very yeah. hard. I hear you and I also hear your pain. Uh, the anti-Semitic uh, patterns here in America yeah. have been very problematic for many, many years. And for you to have witnessed this on your own campus where you still teach, and, uh, and, and I might add uh, admirably and courageously in the wake of how people are thinking. Uh, what's your message to America about getting through this anti-Semitism that we see on the rise here in America? Well, let me tell you something remarkable. This week in synagogues all over the world, the part of the Torah that we're reading is the story of Noah. And if you look at verse 611, it says, the world was filled with violence. In Hebrew, the word for violence in the Torah is Hamas, literally, mm. Hamas. Um, and it's just an extraordinary thing that this week we read that verse. Uh, and my message would be that America has to continue to stand up for American values. And we do that everywhere and ought to do that everywhere. And it's not, we should not be anti-Palestinian. Rather, we should want Palestinians to have the same values and the same opportunities and freedoms that we are so blessed to have in America. And I really, I believe that this country has a beautiful and noble tradition, not always, obviously, it's struggled, it has issues, it has certainly, there are still many pockets of racism, of anti-Semitism, of hatred, but American values criticize America itself. It's like we know what we are supposed to be and we're trying to get there. And I hope that we can help others get there as well. The best thing that could happen is a shift not, remember we, we don't pray for the end of sinners, we pray for the end of sin. Mm. And here too, mm. we don't pray that any individual or group will be wiped out. But we do want the end of an ideology that is intolerant of other people and that is against freedom and, and honestly is against human life. Yeah, you know, you talk about that ideology, and let's, let's be honest and clear, the ideology goes back to something that uh, President George W. Bush had coined the phrase of radical Islamic terrorism. And many people yeah. took exception to that uh, description, and yet we saw out of that uh, the rise of ISIS, and I can recall traveling to the Holy Land uh, when ISIS was beheading people, and, and as I walked uh, on the Via Della Rosa, which is the road that uh, Jesus Christ uh, took exactly. uh, towards Calvary, uh, and, and there was a banner that showed ISIS beheading people, and the scripture that they used was, there will come a time when people will kill each other and think that they're doing it in the name of God. Have we reached that point again? We have indeed. And, and I think that we have to be, I mean, all, all justice requires truth. And what you said is exactly true. There is a radical Islamic ideology which is not to implicate all Muslims, obviously, but there is a radical Islamic ideology that is toxic to the freedoms of the world and certainly, certainly has a, a deep anti-Semitic bias 
And unfortunately, you know, we live in America. We are surrounded by Canada, by Mexico, and two oceans. Most countries are not so blessed. Israel is surrounded by either countries that it has made peace with or countries that wish to destroy it. And, and that's, not, that's not an enviable neighborhood. And for such a neighborhood, you have to be strong. And so Israel right now is, I hope, gathering and going to demonstrate the strength that will at least disable those who would prosecute this ideology in its own backyard. Yeah, that's that uh, wonderful mystery of this thing called hope. Uh, yes. I heard someone uh, talking about the fact that they lost loved ones. They were talking from Israel, lost loved ones in the initial uh, attack, the surprise attack on those kibbutzes along the northern border uh, between Israel and Gaza. And what was remarkable, David, is that he said, yet I still have hope. Now, we'll have to do some heavy lifting and some work to make sure that Hamas is destroyed, but right. he still believed in hope. Yes. How do you hold on to that? And I think those of us who have faith, you know, um, if you have faith, you have hope. If you think that, that uh, God created this world so that we could love and that we could come together, um, there's a debate in the Talmud about what's the most important verse in Scripture. And Rabbi Akiva says, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And then another rabbi, Ben Azai, says, the most important verse is, these are the generations of Adam. Because he said, this shows we all come from the same ancestors. Mm -hmm. Nobody's better than others. And all we have to do is realize that. And then Akiva's verse, you should love your neighbor as yourself, is a natural result of recognizing that everybody is one family. I really believe that one day humanity will recognize that. Um, but it is a long and a painful and sometimes a tragic road. Indeed, my friend. Rabbi David Wolpe, I appreciate you so much as always. Uh, I know I you talk about the Thank beloved community. We've got a lot of li heavy lifting to do to get there. Appreciate you yeah. being on tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be back with more up next. The heartbreak of this war is being felt around the world. It is causing political and ideological division, as well as spiritual division. And here in America, many faith-based Christian and Jewish organizations are expressing another concern. We heard, just heard Rabbi David Wolpe allude to that, the spiritual aspect of the war. Up next, we'll talk to Dr. Raleigh Washington, a pastor who has focused his ministry on building relationships with Jewish, Christians, and Islamic communities. And welcome back to America's Hope. I'm Kelly Wright. Joining us now is Dr. Raleigh Washington. He is the president and CEO of Awakening the Voice of Truth. He is the recipient, or I should point out, the third recipient of the Doctor of Peacemaking Award after Mother Teresa and Bishop Desmond Tutu by Westminster College. He's the past president of the Road to Jerusalem, a faith-based ministry reconciling Jewish, Christian, Islamic, and other faiths together. Dr. Washington, thank you for joining us this hour. And as you know, there is turmoil and warfare going on in Israel. And I wanted to get your assessment of how you view the circumstances that have been unfolding before our very eyes. Oh, well, thank you, Kelly. It's good to be with you. Uh, what's happening is very uh, disconcerting to me, mostly because uh, Christians, believers, do not really understand the full impact of what is happening. Uh, I believe that unless we realize that what Israel is facing is not only a physical conflict and war, but it is also spiritual. Uh, their concept, the Hamas's, uh, they are uh, Islamic. Uh, Jihad is a part of their dynamic. They are radical, and they believe what they're doing is being guided by uh, their God, Allah. I am certainly appalled as I see in the news across America and really in, in nations around the world, there's, there are the hatred for the Jewish people 
is uh, toxic. It's vitriol without question. Mm -hmm. And uh, my concept is uh, I see the Jews as people chosen by God. They are not perfect by any stretch, but they are the ones that God chose. Jesus Christ, who I consider to be the Savior of the world, uh, was Jewish. Uh, and as uh, and, and as I read scripture, believers should understand that the word of God says, when I bless Abraham, which is Israel, God will bless me. When I curse them, God will curse me. And so much of the, of the vitriol and the hatred of God's chosen people is really, according to my word, is cursing my Lord as well. So... When I understand those dynamics, I understand that this is a very, very critical war. It's a critical dynamic. Uh, it's a war to the end. Uh, the Islamics want to eliminate Israel. Israel feel like they have to eliminate the opposition. Well, and that's me, the seriousness of circumstances. Let me ask you, 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 you talked about Islamic. Do you mean it as it relates to the radical Islamic terrorists network of Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, because there are Islamic people who do sympathize and live and work side by side with Israeli Jews and Christians. In fact, some of them are serving together in the Israeli Defense Forces. So when you when you speak about the, the political aspects and you're talking about the spiritual aspects with regard to this physical war, uh, is there a way and a road to reconciliation uh, once Hamas is taken out and this kind of radical uh, ideology, which is sinister in nature in terms of how it uh, uh, viciously attacked innocent people on October 7th in Israel. Uh, Kelly, thank you for that uh, distinction. Uh, Hamas really would be radical Islamic extremists, much different from the people who are Islamic across the board. And what you said, I agree with. There are people who would not really fit into that category. I believe the solution to what is happening and the solution to ending the war is wrapped up in one single word, as I write about in my book. And that word is relationship. If you have a genuine, bona fide, authentic relationship between Muslims and Jews, where they care for one another, respect one another, and honor one another, you would not have the war that you have going on. It is that radical element that feels have an extreme concern. Remove that and establish bona fide, committed relationships. It will end it because I believe relationship really changes everything. Uh, if there is, and as you mentioned, you have Islamics who are fighting beside um, Israel because they don't believe in uh, what is happening with the radical element of it. Uh, that's no different than the fact that we had uh, Japanese people uh, fighting along beside Americans against Japan because uh, they believed uh, and what was happening in America was right, and that they were attacked by Japan, and they, and they fought with this. So the same thing is true. So I started with this in, in the solution, and I'll, and I'll close with it. Relationship changes everything. If there's a genuine, bona fide relationship, it ends it. Uh, and if you notice, uh, when the war against Japan was over, and then there was a truth, then there's a relationship. Today... There's a dynamic relationship between Japan and the United States of America where they respect one another, they honor one another, and there's no talk of war. So do the you solution see, is relationship. Is relationship. Is, do you see that being any possible scenario in solving the crisis that has been going on for years uh, since 1948? And of course, so many people saying death to Israel and death to the United States. Do you see any possibility of, of brokering that, that vicious divide and, and that thought from people who actually espouse uh, a hatred for Jews and for Christians and for America and for Israel? 
Uh, I, I see that in two aspects. From a spiritual aspect, I believe if we understand the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, is really God of the universe who created us all, and if we develop a relationship with him and obey his word, uh, that demands peace. But even if you do not believe that, if you want to have peace that is surpassing, then uh, develop a relationship, a relationship in which it is a give and a take, in which there is mutual respect and mutual honor for one another, then that can happen. We've had peace talks and peace treaties, and uh, on, on occasion they will break down. When they break down is because there's a a problem with the relationship. If that relationship uh, is intact, if that relationship involves honor, respect, and a moral basis in which I really uh, care about my, uh, my neighbor, my neighbor cares about me, if we can establish that and maintain that, it will indeed solve the problem. You know, Dr. Washington, uh, you served as a colonel in the United States military. Uh, from a military standpoint, uh, there are men and women of faith uh, operating uh, as, as members of, of the Israeli Defense Forces. They're all coming together to try to make sure that Hamas is wiped out, uh, albeit they're also trying to make sure that there's uh, that they can reduce the collateral damage of innocent civilians. From a military standpoint, and, and as a man of faith, how do you see that role playing out? Because it is it is very difficult to go into a, a ground warfare and and try to avoid uh, uh, inflicting harm on innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. That is so true. Uh, I learned in the military as I went to the Command and General Staff College at Leavenworth uh, uh, how we fight wars in, in order to win war. When you fight a war, it's because you want to win that war. Uh, one of the things I learned was this principle. Know your enemy. Understand who that enemy is, how that enemy thinks, and then you can predict what that enemy will do. Uh, when that happens, it's there. Uh, the radical element of Islam that is committed to the extermination of the Jews forces Jews to defend them themselves. Uh, uh, urban warfare is probably one of the most treacherous types of war because uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. There are uh, underground uh, systems uh, that involve. There is no question about the fact that there will be uh, lives lost on both sides, significant number. And when you have civilians who are uh, uh, in between, uh, they become collateral damage and they lose their lives. But I, I applaud Israel in this fashion. They sent leaflets and they uh, out that said, leave this area. We are going to attack the radical element, but leave this area. Uh, many left, but there are some who remain. And when that happens, this is one of the uh, uh, downsides of war. Uh, if the people choose not to leave or if they are forced to stay, as some are saying, uh, it is inevitable that they will become casualties of war. Mm. Dr. Washington, I've got about a minute left. What's your prayer and hope for Israel, for America, and for the world? Uh, uh, my prayer is that uh, that we would all come to realize there's a creator. And that creator is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who created us all. And uh, his word really is the Bible. And if we live according to that Bible, we will understand the two greatest commandments is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you satisfy all of the precepts of the Word of God, which includes loving your neighbor, even when that neighbor is not your race, ethnicity, or color. If you live by loving your God and loving your neighbor, 
it will eliminate the circumstances that we face. And I do pray that we will come to that point with Israel and uh, the Palestinians. Dr. Washington, I appreciate your unique perspective. I know you have spent a considerable amount of time in Israel. And of course, I thank you for your service to the United States military and what you've been doing in the faith-based community. Uh, thank you for bringing your insights to this important topic about the war that's unfolding uh, in Israel, the war between Israel and Hamas. I appreciate you being on America's Hope. Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you for what you're doing. Keep doing it because uh, the hope for not only America in this world is really facing situations with the truth. And you're doing that, and I applaud you for it. Thank you, sir. Uh, good day to you. And don't go anywhere, America, because coming up next, we'll talk to Dr. Ben Carson, former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development during the Trump presidency. And what are his concerns and hopes for Israel and Palestinians? That's next on America's Hope. Welcome back to America's Hope. I'm Kelly Wright, and continue our focus now on Israel at war. Joining me now is world-renowned neurosurgeon and former secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Ben Carson. He's also the founder and CEO of the American Cornerstone Institute, which focuses on the principles of faith, liberty, and the common good. Dr. Carson, welcome to tonight's program. Very important time for you to be on with us. Thank you, Kelly. It's always good to be with you. And good to be with you, my friend. You know, in the wake of this war that we're seeing between Israel and Hamas, and it's raging on, uh, let's not forget uh, Ukraine as well. And we see a world where the common good is being undermined by war and violence, which is evil. I got to ask you, what's your assessment of what's happening right now in Israel? Well, obviously, my heart goes out to those people. Uh, who have been just devastated by barbaric activity. And those who are trying to make moral equivalents to this, uh, I don't know where what they're thinking about. Uh, it's horrendous. And it's an example of what happens when people don't care about human life anymore. As we've grown further and further away from our love of life and respect for life, we've become more coarse in our actions toward each other. And there you see people who just have an ideology in mind, and they don't care about the carnage that they create in order to achieve what they're trying to do. Yeah, and we've seen the, the outcome of all this. The results are so, I mean, this dastardly deed inflicted upon innocent people uh, living in kibbutzes and, and most of them trying to live peaceably with their neighbor. Uh, and their neighbors were just happened to be Palestinian neighbors, and yet, we see Hamas uh, rearing its ugly head and going in and conducting the surprise attack on innocent civilians and some of the and, members. And, Go ahead. And doesn't that kind of give you some insight into what happens, the logical conclusion of intolerance and demonization of those who you disagree with? And maybe there's a lesson that we can take from that in our country as we seem to be engaging in those kinds of activities as well. And also, what I'm very concerned about is we see the amount of hatred that is focused on the Jewish uh, nation. Uh, that same hatred, uh, particularly from Iran, is directed toward America, the great Satan, as they see it. And they've had three years to get people in through our open borders and to plan something pretty devastating here. Uh, I would be very surprised if they weren't doing that. You know, I'm glad you went to that point because I was going to ask you, as we look at America, uh, we're watching what's unfolding in Israel, and, and quite a few people who have their eyes open are saying, could the same thing happen here in America? Never forgetting the fact that uh, radical Islamists have always stated that they will come back to fight another day and attack America. And you just talked about the poorest borders that we have uh, along the sort southern border of America and so many people coming in unchecked yes. and unfound. What are you anticipating and how would you prepare America for the possibility of what we've seen in Israel unfolding here? Well, the first thing I would do is close the border. <laughs> 
and, and stop the bleeding. And then, uh, you know, I would require all the people who've come across our border to register. They need to be registered within six months. If they're not registered within six months, they can never apply for American citizenship. Uh, that would incentivize people to come out of their cracks and corners and, and actually get registered. That doesn't make them a citizen. It just means that they would be eligible if they wanted to to work or something like that, but they'd have to pay taxes. But they couldn't become an American citizen unless they went through all the things that everybody else went through. And they would have to make that application from wherever they came from because they don't get to jump the line. So, I mean, we have to put some rules and regulations in uh, if we're going to preserve the sovereignty of our nation. And, you know, some people say, but that's too tough. That's too stringent. It's not too tough or too stringent. We have a nation, a sovereign nation, and we have the right to make the rules for how it's run. Absolutely. When you were serving in the uh, Trump administration, there was quite a, a move to actually make sure that the borders were tightened, not only uh, to the north, but certainly along the southern border where there have been problems. Uh, I, I got to ask you about the Biden administration and, and how it's responding to the crisis that's going on in Israel. Uh, what, what do you say about the way they've been conducting themselves so far diplomatically and standing with Israel? Well, I'm pleased that they're standing with Israel, at least uh, in word. And, uh, you know, I'm not particularly pleased that they seem to be reluctant to implicate uh, Iran. Iran is obviously behind this. Uh, this. This operation was very sophisticated and complex and required uh, more than Hamas has at its beck and call. So we know that there's more coordination going on there. And unless we get tough with our adversaries, they will win. I mean, I, I think about David, King David in the Bible, and uh, how he dealt with uh, the evil adversaries that were around. You know, there was no room to sit there and say, oh, well, they're really nice people. So. You know, maybe maybe we should just uh, not worry too much about them. They'll be good in the long run. Uh, it doesn't necessarily work that way, particularly when you're trying to preserve a nation. Yeah, what you're talking about is appeasement. And, and certainly there's been a lot of appeasement towards uh, Iran uh, within uh, certain accounts that have gone on this uh, within this administration. And, and so are your concerns about how we go forward? Do you... Uh, do you at least see uh, that there's a strategy to try to stop what's going on uh, between Hamas uh, and Hezbollah and Iran? I see a strategy to try to make everybody happy. Mm. And that doesn't necessarily work in this kind of a situation. Iran, on the other hand, has a very strategic goal of developing a nuclear weapon. And when they get it, they're not going to threaten Israel with it. They're going to use it. And it's going to create a very, very difficult problem for us. So we should be much more concentrating on making sure that they don't get that weapon because the results are going to be devastating. Yeah, and you're talking about a country where the Ayatollah, the Grand Ayatollah, has stated death to Israel and death to the United States. Uh, in, in terms of the geopolitical aspects and the ramifications of what we see unfolding in, uh, in, in, in Iran and Israel, Dr. Carson, is Iran operating by itself or is there a nexus with them, Russia, China, North Korea? Uh, I believe that there are a number of entities that wish to see the demise of our nation. And uh, a lot of people think that that's a recent origin. That's been going on for quite a long time. Now, if you look back at the congressional record, 1963, January 10, read into the congressional record by uh, Congressman Herlong of Florida, were the 45 goals of communism in America. It's this very same stuff that you can see that's going on right now. This is intentional, including the division 
of our populace and the loss of the understanding of the common good and trying to break everybody up into factions and make whatever it is that their goal is take primacy over everyone else. These kinds of manipulations are not good for us. The breakdown of the family because the values are passed on through the family. And if you have families breaking down, you have no values being passed on. And the destruction of our history or the distortion of our history, because your history is what your identity is based on and your identity is what your beliefs are based on. And has that affected, uh, as you were talking about earlier, has that affected how people are responding to what's unfolding in Israel? For example, as you've talked about, the, the, the people standing up and saying uh, incorrigible things about uh, the attack on Israel, uh, have we forgotten our history? Uh, obviously we have. You know, when I look at the university students, uh, you know, praising what Hamas has done, uh, obviously they are not doing this uh, with the perspective of world history behind them and knowing what terrorism does and what communism does and what Marxism does. They don't understand those things. Uh, and that makes them easy to manipulate. You know, interestingly enough, there was a time when we concentrated much more on the education of our populace. America had one of the most educated populaces in the world. Uh, and if you don't believe that, just look at a sixth grade exit exam from 150 to 200 years ago. See what you had to do to get a sixth grade certificate. And, and, and contrast that with the man on the street interviews that you see today when people can't answer the, the simplest of questions. Well, if you have a dumbed down population, they become much easier to control and to manipulate. Based on what you're seeing, uh, Dr. Carson, what's your hope for the outcome in Israel as it relates to your hope for America? Well, I, I'm hopeful that uh, as they have in the past, they'll be able to fend this off, but they won't be able to do it by themselves. They will clearly need more than words from us. They will need our involvement. And we have to understand that we can't just sacrifice Israel and say, well, it's just a small country. They only have a few million people. It represents much more than that. And if we allow the radical Islamic to win, believe me, that will just be win in their cells. And, uh, it will be very bad for the rest of the world. You said something in that moment uh, about uh, the importance of Israel that I want to talk about. You alluded to that Judeo-Christian principle that we get between Jewish and Christian faiths coming to America and creating this document called the U.S. Constitution. Uh, our future and our present state, are they intertwined between what we see in Israel and America? Uh, I believe they are because, you know, it's our values that are being defended, our Judeo-Christian values. What do they teach us? To love your neighbor, not to hate your neighbor, not to cancel your neighbor if they disagree with you. They teach us the value of human life and the respect for others and the respect for elders. And a lot of those cornerstone principles that were involved in the development of our nation. And it was no accident that our nation went from a bunch of ragtag militiamen to the pinnacle of the world in record time. It was because of our belief system. And we were good people. We didn't try to pillage and ravage all the other nations of the world just because we were stronger than they were. And when Alexis de Tocqueville came to America in 1831 to try to analyze us, because the Europeans were fascinated how a nation barely 50 years old could compete with them on virtually every level, he was blown away by so many aspects of our country. But he said the sermons that came out of those pulpits that gave those soldiers the courage, ragtag militiamen, to beat the most powerful military force on earth 
Think about that. It's like Cuba beating us today. And uh, in the end, he said, the American people actually have a sense of morality, a sense of good and evil, of right and wrong. And he said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Ben Carson. Back in a moment with my final word. And welcome back to America. So my final word tonight is based on what we heard from Dr. Raleigh Washington, Rabbi David Wolpe, and Dr. Ben Carson. All three men fundamentally agree that our common good and our common ground must be found in scripture that says, love God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. Perhaps that's where we've gone wrong. Perhaps that's why there's so much hate, because people fail to look in the mirror and love the person they see. To sum it all up, it is time to learn how to be our brother's keeper and not our brother's killer. Until next time, America, strive to let hope endure and prevail and spread some love, freedom, and peace. Good night. Your America and my America. United we stand, divided.